Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. We are on our last segment with Ian Baker about his book, Tibetan Yoga, Principles and Practices. And so far we've talked about embodiment in the first segment, element practice in our second, so long in our third. And in this final segment, we're going to be talking about Tumo practice and Chukor. And um, again, I'm going to ask the kind of, if, if you could indulge me, it's been really interesting to just like high level description when what is the intention of this practice? Where does it come from? And sure. how one would integrate this within their individual practice. I know we talked about that a little bit already, but just where does this fit in? What tool? Is it a hammer or a saw? Like, I just want to get a basic yeah. sense of it. Yeah, so basically those are exotic Tibetan words, uh, trulkor and tumo, but they're very related in the sense that uh, trulkor literally translates as sort of illusory magic wheel but what it really is referring to are yogic movements um, and to some degree these are hatha yoga movements that are uh, performed in a dynamic sequence uh, more like kriya yoga uh, with held breath and the held breath is a way in which these movements are directing what we referred to before as prana or in tibetan as it's called lung um, uh, spreading this throughout the nadis or the energetic pathways uh, in the body. And this is connected very much uh, with tumo, uh, which can be, uh, is often sort of translated as inner fire, the, the yoga of inner fire, inner heat. Um, and this is not just sort of heat in the sense that you're just raising your body temperature. Um, it's uh, an inner, it's a principle of inner fire that in, according to the tradition in a sort of sense incinerates our karmic winds in a sense all of the kind of um, afflictive emotions and thoughts that that keep us on a in a sense of a restricted sense of who and what we are the idea of tumo is 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 about expansion and is very much connected to the principle of what uh, is called you know in sanskrit ananda or in uh Dewa in Tibetan, so bliss. So what are we what are we talking? Why is bliss important? Because this is really what the true core practice and the tumo is about. It's about cultivating a f experience, a blissful state of awareness that's highly energized, and which in that sense uh, is not about the kind of indulgent bliss, but it's a bliss that kind of that basically supplants desire. Mm -hmm. We think of desire as, you know, let's say in the Buddhist narrative, um, you know, in the earliest um, teachings of the Buddha, he referred to, you know, life as being suffering caused by our attachments and our excessive desires. And so the idea of renunciation in early Buddhism 2,500 years ago was to sort of renounce those activities that would bring us into, that would stimulate desire because this was going to always lead to a state of dissatisfaction because these could never be fully fulfilled. So we talked in our earlier conversation about how tantric Buddhism kind of moved beyond that kind of um, renunciatory or ascetic narrative into one that was more expansive. Out, it developed out, it made Buddhism relevant outside of a monastic environment and made it, brought it back into the life of the householder, or the, the yogin, uh, someone who was engaged with life and was integrating these states into rather than seeing them as problematic, it was about transforming them. Uh, so this is the idea of trokor, uh, that these yogic movements are a way of stimulating uh, these energies and accessing, you could say, this state, this blissful awareness, um, using the breath, using the body in order to bring about a state of awareness that in a way is self um, self-transcendent hmm. um, and that really you know if we kind of if we look at what is because bliss doesn't have an objective uh, you know desire we usually think oh there's somebody if there's a desire you have desire for something it's very dualistic there's a subject and there's an object that there's your object of desire there's not an there's never an object of bliss bliss is the state in which desire reaches a kind of natural kind of state of completion uh, in the sense that it's the, it's the non-dual state. And that's why it is understood to be so important in Tantric Buddhism. And it's, it's referred to as uh, 
deton uh, in Tibetan, which means bliss uh, inseparable from emptiness, because emptiness is this concept in Buddhism of uh, that um, it's a it's a it's a poor translation of the word shunyata, which means that basically it's kind of the infinite potentiality that underlies manifest reality. So that's really more what shunyata is referring to. It's not just a kind of a vacuum or vacuity. Void of nothingness. It's like, no, it's just, just this infinite potential that can take any direction. But when the natural bliss that's associated with that is the kind of, again, looking at the Shaiva tradition or even the Vedantic tradition, this sat chit ananda, this being, this consciousness and bliss are, um, you know, this is the this is the state of awareness that is transcendent of our normal ways in which we identify with with our experience. Mm. And if we're actually saturated by that experience of, of, of beingness and consciousness, awareness and bliss, then our relationships with other people, with nature, are going to be harmonious. They're going to be mm. uh, cooperative, based upon this this deep uh, recognition of the interconnectivity of all life and all experience. So that you know, we move beyond, let's say, the kind of uh, the the competitive um, ideal that's unfortunately sort of built into our capitalist lifestyle. Uh, and instead, we have this kind of more cooperation, you know, what we would now call, let's say, on a political level, you know, the compassionate capitalism, mm. where you're recognizing this, this, the, the, the fluidity um, uh, and interconnectedness between things and how we use um, our resources uh, in every way uh, to bring about a, uh, to, to work within that, that interconnectivity, uh, rather than, you know, uh, working for me first, kind of uh, an ideal, which, uh, you know, this, that's the bottom line is the interconnected ideal. So the Tumo, the inner fire practice is, um, it's, it's, again, it transcends, certainly it's not, it's one of the hallmarks, you could say, of the, of the Tibetan tantric Buddhist path, you know, the great Yogi Milarepa, it's how he reached enlightenment, the first uh, Tibetan who was supposed to have reached enlightenment was actually Yeshi Sogyal. She was a Tibetan princess who again reached enlightenment through this practice of inner fire because of its ability to supplant our ordinary desire, desiring consciousness, grasping consciousness with, with a state of just self-transcendent bliss. So this is why, and we see this uh, you know, certainly in the Shaiva tradition and the, um, um, as well. And we see it, you know, we also see the kind of contemporary, I'm sure some of your audience are aware of like Wim Hof, for example, and the, you know, he, originally before it was the Wim Hof method, he was called, you know, he had his website called innerfire.com. Mm. And the practice was a, originally his own version of Tumo, um, which worked with, Kind of, he was in the same way. Let's let's say uh, Michael Harner took uh, shamanism and sort of turned into a kind of core shamanism. Mm -hmm. uh, Wim Hof also took the the Tumo practices um, mm -hmm. and brought those into kind of a core inner fire practice mm -hmm. that could bring about this kind of very very high state of of well being that had both, you know, healing as as we actually have seen with that method, for example. It, brings about uh, a heightened immunity you know he, for example he'll do the practice the breathing practices and then not just him but other one uh, have been studied now where they'll be injected with bacteria that would should bring about a kind of surface um, uh, allergic reaction but because of the the way the the inner fire practice has been done the breathing has been done it doesn't you know your immune system has overridden uh, these kind of um, um, uh, reaction, you know, the normal reactions that they would have. So this is where I think Tumo, you know, if we look at that, we, we, we talked in the beginning in the first session about this tendency, sometimes we have to romanticize the exotic, to romanticize the pre-modern, certainly Tibet has been romanticized. Um, but when we really look at what we what can be learned from that tradition? We see that Tumo, in a certain sense, I would say, is the takeaway from all of this. It's what the true core is based upon, the Tsalung is based upon. It's all about 
bringing about this state of heightened vitality on a level of health and a heightened state of self-transcendent awareness uh, on, a, on a psychological or a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. And, and why is that important? Is simply because it does reorient our relationships, um, both with ourself and others. We, we can bring about a sense of, of compassion and wisdom in the sense of just understanding the interconnectivity of all of life is just implicit within it. Mm-hmm. In that sense, all of the, the five elements have been harmonized. And um, in that sense, we, we live in harmony with the five elements um, inside and around us and therefore with other beings as well so i mean and having been the person who started off with a tumo practice just because i had um kriyas and i was trying to get it managed is um i would say that it's a lot of focusing on this pulling all of your energy into the central channel and like using it almost like a rocket ship to like blast through karmic knots um are in your central channel so it's very central channel oriented Mm -hmm. that i would say that it while it has done so much in terms of like i no longer shake i grunt but i don't shake and it's (laughs) some some predictability of when it's going to happen when i do make weird like it it started off with like spontaneous movements that just you know be like yeah 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 (laughs) <laughs> and now it's related to like when I'm in meditation, I'll just like, oh, like just make some weird noise that I don't even understand. And even that has been calming down. But I would say that the only thing is that it doesn't, I, I guess what I'm missing, my own personal experience, and perhaps who knows why I have a different personal experience is I, I didn't have as much connection with like the world around me, you know, because mm-hmm. as you're explaining it, as I'm clearing out, there's just this natural bliss and interconnectedness with everything. And I feel like I haven't gotten that without, I'm getting that now with doing the element practices um, and connected to my body. It wasn't, it didn't feel as embodied to me as some of these other practices. So yeah. whether it's just the brand of Tumo that I was exposed to, or if that's a natural outcome yeah well it's a very intensive practice um obviously tumo and it does bring about as you have you experienced these these uh non-ordinary states you could say but it's very interesting because you know for example in bhutan when the tumo practice is done this way and you you know it's about the fire below but it's also about the melting of our um the so-called white element in the in the we can almost say in the pineal gland it's about a release of bliss from the top part of the body. And when that state happens, it's very much, uh, you work with the elements in nature. So for example, mm. uh, just in a retreat in Bhutan, for example, when the when you've cultivated the fire, then you go and immerse yourself in this freezing cold uh, water, you know, coming down from the glaciers of the Himalayas. Uh, so you're, you're activating and, and challenging Mm. Uh, the body in very, very, you know, in interesting ways. And we could almost see secular versions of that in the West, for example, with, you know, what happens in the Nordic countries, you know, with the hot sauna, then you go out and you roll around in the snow. Mm. It's this idea of just almost communion with the outer elements. In this case, you know, not just with with uh, earth and water, but earth and ice. <laughs> so, um, and we also see that in, for example, the Wim Hof method in which they the breathing practice is again uh, amplified through cold exposure, uh, which is which is not always blissful, but it does actually bring about a cathartic. I mean, we know that it, what it does, for example, with the polyvagal uh, stimulation, and so there's this sort of rush and uh, of energy um, and a rebalancing, you could say, uh, through what's called, you know, the horm- uh, hormetic stress, mm-hmm. in other words, stress that actually helps us to grow and develop and that we sort of embrace, you know, just as, as, you know, in that tradition, uh, to say, you know, the, the cold is your friend. So in other words, it, which is really the tantric principle of moving into that, which we are not necessarily initially comfortable with. And yet that's where our growth happens. 
Mm. So I would say this is really, you know, the ultimate principle of, uh, of tantric yoga, whether it's in the Tibetan tradition or the Shaiva tradition, or really as it's starting to become uh, reinvented in the West, integrated into the West, it's about, you know, not always seeking a comfort zone, not, you know, we gain resilience, not by actually just finding where we feel comfortable, we gain resilience by actually challenging ourselves in, 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 um, in, in, you know, in ways that actually are beneficial for ourselves and others, not in ways that are necessarily, you mm. know, harmful or, um, but I think this is really in a way that what I see happening is that all these exotic practices will over time, and it will be over a long period of time, perhaps become something that we recognize as part of our own being. They're not, again, this romanticization of an exotic uh, art, uh, spiritual tradition, but they're things that are natural to our own being yeah. and it, find different methods, whether they're shamanic, whether they're Shaiva, they're Buddhist or something else that may be emerging from all of this and a kind of an integral, uh, core set of practices by which we can very quickly transcend all of those kind of inhibiting ideas, concepts that, that keep us uh, entrenched in, sometimes debilitating uh, orientation towards life and existence. So the big aha for me is with that explanation is, so I actually, I don't have, you know, the practice that I've, the, at least what I've learned is not to, what the key aha was the balancing part, which uh -huh. is like, I literally get hives. I get so hot that I break mm -hmm. out in hives all along. Oh. Back. It's just like uh -huh. red, itchy spots all on my back and I literally have to take um, I actually take a shower that's the only thing that calms it down so fire water not yeah. a shower but just a shower the water and I didn't understand it until this very moment but if I but if I think about like you know I used to have my arm would spontane it has this kind of wind like quality if I'm like oh yeah. this is wind what I need to do to ground it is be more in earth I would have like it, just knowing the elements helps me balance this whole um, uh, kundalini practice so that it's, there's like, you know, I have the little levers to adjust. So when my body is kind of like, help me, <laughs> like I don't yeah, know what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah. And I, I, there were another one I used to have with my head would circle around. Uh -huh. which, I think now that I understand it is like the movement. I can't remember. It's like probably a water element, but it's now it's, it's like, Oh, I see my body was trying to talk to me throughout this whole time, mm. giving me indications of balancing points to balance the practice. But I didn't have the knowledge that I have now of the five mm. elements, nor did I know what curative thing I could yeah. But you're also releasing those blockages, you could say, in that central axis of the body. And as we as we can also think of those, those elements are also in the chakras. You know, we have the earth element at the muladhara, you know, the water at the, you know, below the navel. And, you know, we have the fire of the heart, you know, the space. It's it's also a kind of, not a hierarchy, but it's a kind of vertical axis uh, in which those elements are that we can work with them and integrate them. And so sometimes these movements are just ways of releasing the blockages that, um, because all of them have to be in a dynamic flow. It's not like we uh, have to work, you know, they all have to be uh, integrated into our experience, but it sounds like that's, you know, what, what you're doing and that the, and when these movements happen or whether they're spontaneous sounds, I mean, in the Tibetan tradition, what they call the, in the Dzogchen or the great perfection, the, the, the final, you know, when that happens, you know, we certainly don't look at that as being, we don't label it as either good or bad, just like we don't label a thought as being good or bad, but actually one can actually look, uh, one can use the practice of, uh, well, who is it that made that sound? Who is it that's making this movement? It becomes a for another level mm -hmm. of self inquiry that actually moves us beyond the kind of conventional self identifications uh, that normal, you know, that can keep us in a, in a, in a, in a circular track that doesn't, doesn't move forward sometimes. So sometimes it's just that inquiry, you know, who is it 
um, that's making it because in a certain sense, that's where the emptiness principle comes in. There's no, well, there's nobody there, but that doesn't mean it's empty. It's just that this is just this infinite potentiality uh, in which we dwell and uh, which is that natural state of, of, um, of, of, of blissful awareness that yeah. uh, is I get our under, underlying condition. Yeah. I get that. It's like, don't try to understand it. Don't try to figure it out. This is, this is not yeah, in that yeah. direction because it doesn't. No make, end to that. Yeah. No end to that. The more you go into it, you're making converting energy into matter. Yes. <laughs> Interesting to even, but, but I don't know. I can't help it anyways. My uh -huh. my goes into well isn't that interesting these are until this very moment until this conversation i didn't even recognize that those 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 things that were presenting were really elements releasing mm. um and and even knowing like okay so that just means that it could be helpful if it's getting out of control let's say and it's you know i'm in a business meeting my arm goes like that yeah. it could be helpful to you know, do some grounding and that's going to help kind of calm. Yeah, and grounding is your earth element and that can be visualizing kind of that golden ochre, yellow color, breathing down into the lower, the you know, lower abdomen. Yeah. And just, you know, that'll bring you out of the, you know, these air manifestations, which uh, are wonderful too. They're releasing, but release but then it's like grounding it so it's not yeah so there are times when you want to emphasize one or the other yeah yeah i love that, that was so personally helpful um the whole thing was just fascinating thank you so much we've been talking to ian baker about his book tibetan yoga principles and practices thank you so much thank you very much cj